The reasoning faculty is often faulty because it is largely guided by one's accumulated experience. Not all knowledge which one accumulates through experience is accurate. Ideas received through the creative faculty are much more reliable for the reason that they come from sources more reliable than any which are available to the reasoning faculty of the mind. The major difference between the genius and the ordinary crank inventor may be found in the fact that the genius works through his faculty of creative imagination while the crank knows nothing of this faculty. The scientific inventor such as Mr. Edison and Dr. Gates makes use of both the synthetic and the creative faculties of imagination. For example, the scientific inventor or genius begins an invention by organizing and combining the known ideas or principles accumulated through experience through the synthetic faculty, the reasoning faculty. If he finds this accumulated knowledge to be insufficient for the completion of his invention, he then draws upon the sources of knowledge available to him through his creative faculty. The method by which he does this varies with the individual, but this is the sum and substance of his procedure. 1. He stimulates his mind so that it vibrates on a higher than average plane, using one or more of the ten mind stimulants or some other stimulant of his choice. 2. He concentrates upon the known factors, the finished part of his invention and creates in his mind a perfect picture of unknown factors, the unfinished part of his invention. He holds this picture in mind until it has been taken over by the subconscious mind, then relaxes by clearing his mind of all thought and waits for his answer to flash into his mind. Sometimes the results are both definite and immediate. At other times, the results are negative, depending upon the state of development of the sixth sense or creative faculty. Mr. Edison tried out more than 10,000 different combinations of ideas through the synthetic faculty of his imagination before he tuned in through the creative faculty and got the answer which perfected the incandescent light. His experience was similar when he produced the talking machine. There is plenty of reliable evidence that the faculty of creative imagination exists. This evidence is available through accurate analysis of men who have become leaders in their respective callings without having had extensive educations. Lincoln was a notable example of a great leader who achieved greatness through the discovery and use of his faculty of creative imagination. He discovered and began to use this faculty as a result of the stimulation of love which he experienced after he met Anne Rutledge. A statement of the highest significance in connection with the study of the source of genius. The pages of history are filled with the records of great leaders whose achievements may be traced directly to the influence of women who aroused the creative faculties of their minds through the stimulation of sex desire. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of these. When inspired by his first wife, Josephine, he was irresistible and invincible. When his better judgment or reasoning faculty prompted him to put Josephine aside, he began to decline. His defeat and Saint Helena were not far distant. If good taste would permit, we might easily mention scores of men well known to the American people who climbed to great heights of achievement under the stimulating influence of their wives, only to draw back to destruction after money and power went to their heads and they put aside the old wife for a new one. Napoleon was not the only man to discover that sex influence from the right source is more powerful than any substitute of expediency which may be created by mere reason. The human mind responds to stimulation. Among the greatest and most powerful of these stimuli is the urge of sex. When harnessed and transmuted, this driving force is capable of lifting men into that higher sphere of thought 
which enables them to master the source of worry and petty annoyance which beset their pathway on the lower plane. Unfortunately, only the genii have made the discovery. Others have accepted the experience of sex urge without discovering one of its major potentialities, a fact which accounts for the great number of others as compared to the limited number of genii. For the purpose of refreshing the memory in connection with the facts available from the biographies of certain men, we here present the names of a few men of outstanding achievement, each of whom was known to have been of a highly sexed nature. The genius which was theirs undoubtedly found its source of power in transmuted sex energy. George Washington Napoleon Bonaparte, William Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Robert Burns, Thomas Jefferson, Albert Hubbard, Albert H. Gary, Oscar Wilde, Woodrow Wilson, John H. Patterson, Andrew Jackson, Enrico Caruso. Your own knowledge of biography will enable you to add to this list. Find, if you can, a single man in all history of civilization who achieved outstanding success in any calling who was not driven by a well-developed sex nature. If you do not wish to rely upon biographies of men not now living, take inventory of those whom you know to be men of great achievement and see if you can find one among them who is not highly sexed. Sex energy is the creative energy of all genii. There never has been and never will be a great leader, builder or artist lacking in this driving force of sex. Surely, no one will misunderstand these statements to mean that all who are highly sexed are genii. Man attains to the status of a genius only when and if he stimulates his mind so that it draws upon the forces available through the creative faculty of the imagination. Chief among the stimuli with which this stepping up of the vibrations may be produced is sex energy. The mere possession of this energy is not sufficient to produce a genius. The energy must be transmuted from desire for physical contact into some other form of desire and action before it will lift one to the status of a genius. Far from becoming genii, because of great sex desires, the majority of men lower themselves through misunderstanding and misuse of this great force to the status of the lower animals. Why men seldom succeed before 40? I discovered from the analysis of over 25,000 people that men who succeed in an outstanding way, seldom do so before the age of 40 and more often they do not strike their real pace until they are well beyond the age of 50. This fact was so astounding that it prompted me to go into the study of its cause most carefully, carrying the investigation over a period of more than 12 years. This study disclosed the fact that the major reason why the majority of men who succeed do not begin to do so before the age of 40 to 50 is their tendency to dissipate their energies through overindulgence in physical expression of the emotion of sex. The majority of men never learn that the urge of sex has other possibilities which far transcend in importance, that of mere physical expression. The majority of those who make this discovery do so after having wasted many years at a period when the sex energy is at its height prior to the age of 45 to 50. This usually is followed by noteworthy achievement. The lives of many men up to and sometimes well past the age of 40 reflect a continued dissipation of energies which could have been more profitably turned into better channels. They are finer and more powerful emotions are sown wildly to the four winds. Out of this habit of the male grew the term sowing his wild oats. The desire for sexual expression is by far the strongest 
and most impelling of all the human emotions and for this very reason this desire when harnessed and transmuted into action other than that of physical expression may raise one to the status of a genius one of america's most able businessmen frankly admitted that his attractive secretary was responsible for most of the plans he created he admitted that her presence lifted him to heights of creative imagination such as he could experience under no other stimulus one of the most successful men in america owes most of his success to the influence of a very charming young woman who has served as his source of inspiration for more than 12 years everyone knows the man to whom this reference is made but not everyone knows the real source of his achievements history is not lacking in examples of men who attained to the status of genii as a result of the use of artificial mind stimulants in the form of alcohol and narcotics edgar allan poe wrote the raven while under the influence of liquor dreaming dreams that mortal never dared to dream before james whitcomb riley did his best writing while under the influence of alcohol perhaps it was thus he saw the ordered intermingling of the real and the dream the mill above the river and the mist above the steam robert burns wrote best when intoxicated for all lang syne my dear we'll take a cup of kindness yet for all lang syne but let it be remembered that many such men have destroyed themselves in the end nature has prepared her own potions with which men may safely stimulate their minds so they vibrate on a plane that enables them to tune into the fine and rare thoughts which come from no man knows where no satisfactory substitute for nature's stimulants has ever been found it is a fact well known to psychologists that there is a very close relationship between sex desires and spiritual urges a fact which accounts for the peculiar behavior of people who participate in the orgies known as religious revivals common among the primitive types the world is ruled and the destiny of civilization is established by the human emotions people are influenced in their actions not by reason so much as by feelings the creative faculty of the mind is set into action entirely by emotions and not by cold reason the most powerful of all human emotions is that of sex there are other mind stimulants some of which have been listed but no one of them nor all of them combined can equal the driving power of sex a mind stimulant is any influence which will either temporarily or permanently increase the vibrations of thought the 10 major stimulants described are those most commonly resorted to through these sources one may commune with infinite intelligence or enter at will the storehouse of the subconscious mind either one's own or that of another person a procedure which is all there is of genius a teacher who has trained and directed the efforts of more than 30000 sales people made the astounding discovery that highly sexed men are the most efficient salesmen the explanation is that the factor of personality known as personal magnetism is nothing more nor less than sex energy highly sexed people always have a plentiful supply of magnetism through cultivation and understanding this vital force may be drawn upon and used to great advantage in the relationships between people this energy may be communicated to others through the following media one the handshake the touch of the hand indicates instantly the presence of magnetism or the lack of it two the tone of voice magnetism or sex energy is the factor with which the voice may be colored or made musical and charming 3 posture and carriage of the body highly sexed people move briskly and with grace and ease 4 the vibrations of thought 
highly sexed people mix the emotion of sex with their thoughts or may do so at will and in that way may influence those around them. 5. Body Adornment People who are highly sexed are usually very careful about their personal experience. They usually select clothing of a style becoming to their personality, physique, complexion, etc. When employing salesmen, the more capable sales manager looks for the quality of personal magnetism as the first requirement of a salesman. People who lack sex energy will never become enthusiastic nor inspire others with enthusiasm and enthusiasm is one of the most important requisites in salesmanship no matter what one is selling. The public speaker, orator, preacher, lawyer or salesman who is lacking in sex energy is a flop as far as being able to influence others is concerned. Coupled with this the fact that most people can be influenced only through an appeal to their emotions and you will understand the importance of sex energy as a part of the salesman's native ability. Master salesmen attain the status of mastery in selling because they, either consciously or unconsciously, transmute the energy of sex into sales enthusiasm. In this statement may be found a very practical suggestion as to the actual meaning of sex transmutation. The salesman who knows how to take his mind off the subject of sex and direct it in sales effort with as much enthusiasm and determination as he would apply to its original purpose has acquired the art of sex transmutation whether he knows it or not. The majority of salesmen who transmute their sex energy do so without being in the least aware of what they are doing or how they are doing it. Transmutation of sex energy calls for more willpower than the average person cares to use for this purpose. Those who find it difficult to summon willpower sufficient for transmutation may gradually acquire this ability. Though this requires willpower, the reward for the practice is more than worth the effort. The entire subject of sex is one which the majority of people appear to be unpardonably ignorant. The urge of sex has been grossly misunderstood, slandered and burlesqued by the ignorant and the evil-minded for so long that the very word sex is seldom used in polite society. Men and women who are known to be blessed, yes, blessed with highly sexed natures are usually looked upon as viewing people who will bear watching. Instead of being called blessed, they are usually called cursed. Millions of people, even in this age of enlightenment, have inferiority complexes which they developed because of this false belief that a highly sexed nature is a curse. These statements of the virtue of sex energy should not be construed as justification for the libertine. The emotion of sex is a virtue only when used intelligently and with discrimination. It may be misused and often is to such an extent that it debases instead of enriches both body and mind. The better use of this power is the burden of this chapter. It seemed quite significant to the author when he made the discovery that practically every great leader whom he had the privilege of analyzing was a man whose achievements were largely inspired by a woman. In many instances, the woman in the case was a modest, self-denying wife of whom the public had heard but little or nothing. In a few instances, the source of inspiration has been traced to the other woman. Perhaps such cases may not be entirely unknown to you.